everyone at the meeting will be recorded and available to view on the Council's website. You could ask uh, IT colleagues to start the recording. Uh, for Cabinet gets underway, a couple of uh, things to mention. First of all, before uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Councillor Jones. I don't know if she's here yet, but she's uh, uh, Councillor Jones is online, uh, Chair of the Governance and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, Governance and Scrutiny of Thursday, 2nd of March, fully considered the Council's cost of living uh, warm welcome spaces workstream and the report has been brought back to Cabinet today by the Deputy Chief Executive with details of their considerations. Councillor Jones will therefore uh, be participating in item four, uh, warm welcome spaces. Uh, also, before I start today's uh, business, I would like to welcome Dr David Lewis, uh, the new Church of Scotland representative. Uh, welcome, David, uh, to your first, uh, first meeting of uh, cabinet. I would also like uh, to let you know that Harriet Johnson, our third uh, church rep, will be taking adoption uh, leave from the end of May and returning early December. And on behalf of cabinet, we'd like to wish her all the best for that process. Okay, uh, now back to the kind of main agenda, and Christine will do the sedating and intimate apologies. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, members. Councillor Douglas Reid. Yeah. Councillor Jim McMahon. Yeah. Councillor John McFadgen. Councillor McFadgen. No. Councillor Elaine Kevin. Here. Councillor Maury Mackay. No. Councillor Ian Linton. No. Councillor Graham Barton. Yeah. I have an apology from Councillor Barry Douglas, Councillor Neil Ingram. Yep. Councillor Claire Maitland. Yeah. Councillor Drew Filson. Yeah. I have an apology. I have an apology from um, Harriet Johnston, Dr. David Lewis. Yeah. Babs Merritt. I'm here. Norman Watt. Here. Jackie Livingston. Hey, I'm here. Can I just go back? Um, do we have Councillor Mackay? Uh, yes, present, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Linton? No. Councillor McFadgen? Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. Somebody's been moving the desk about here. I'll just. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Item one, we've got the declarations of interest. Uh, anybody got any items that wish to declare? I don't think there's anything straight, particularly obvious. No. Okay, we're going to uh, item 2E, and that's the appointment of the Church of Scotland representative to serve in the Council's decision making structure in respect of education business. Uh, they, I suppose. If a member of the Church of Scotland better declare an interest, no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> OK, David, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chair, morning, members. Uh, should probably call for a spoiler alert with your opening comments, because obviously <laughs> the purpose of this paper is simply to advise Cabinet that the Church of Scotland have intimated that their prior or previous representative, the Reverend Dr Alan Vint, uh, will now have his place taken on Cabinet by Dr David Lewis, uh, as per your, your introductory remarks, and welcome to, to Dr Lewis. Uh, as members are aware, the Church of Scotland, uh, along with the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland, have the prerogative to nominate their representative. The process is it comes to Cabinet for Cabinet simply to note it. <clears throat> but in terms of the 1973 Act and the legislation, it notionally takes Council to approve this. So this will go up in the minute to Council in June to formally approve uh, the appointment of Dr Lewis in place of Dr Dr Vint. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's for noting uh, that that's been intimated, uh, and it's really just for for members to to take note of that just now, Chair. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Father David. Uh, can we agree to know it uh, and welcome again? <laughs> okay, uh, item three e now, and that's school uh, secondary school leaver attainment. Uh, Linda, do you want to introduce Graham? Or? Yeah, 
Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members and colleagues. I um, would like to present this paper on senior phase attainment relating to the levers of the academic academic year at 21-22 and hand over to uh, Graham McGinn, Deputy Head of Education for Performance and Assurance. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Chair. Morning, members. So, as Linda said, the purpose of the report is to provide the Cabinet with a summary of school lever attainment for 2021-22, following the release of national data at the end of February 2023. The recommendations are detailed in paragraph two, and I would like to spend a wee bit of time just going through some of the background uh, in the lead up to the examinations and the alternatives that were put in place for examinations uh, at the period of time when exams were cancelled. So the alternative certification models were, are described in paragraphs three to nine, and that describes the approach to certification over the past three years and explain how results in national qualifications were awarded in 2020 and 2021 when national examinations were cancelled. In paragraph eight, I'd like to highlight the experience of young people who left in S6 in 2021-22, because these young people experienced three different approaches to certification. So when they were in S4, the results were determined via the alternative certification model, which was based on teacher professional judgments. When they progressed to S5 and exams were still cancelled, their results were determined via the alternative certification model, which was not just on teacher professional judgments, but was also based on course assessments throughout that session. Then when they progressed into S6, the exams were, were back in and the results were determined via the return of national examinations of, for courses which have examinations, of course. So three different approaches to certification that young people who left school in S6 last year experienced. It's quite significant for a year group um, and it's unusual, you know, given that any year groups up until that point had experienced exams only. So what I'd like to do next is highlight the impact of different approaches to certification. So the impact can be demonstrated in paragraph nine and the chart that's in that, that uh, paragraph. So chart one and the impact of national awards at ATC levels is displayed in the chart at paragraph nine. So in summary, what is shown is that in 2020, when results were determined by professional teacher professional judgment, Results increased from the previous year where there were exams in place. In 2021, you'll see that when the assessments were in introduced, but not exams, the results decreased slightly. And then when we had the return of the national examinations in 21-22, the results reduced again. Now, that, that's no comparison or, or comment on the different approaches. It's just simply to highlight that there were different approaches in place in each of those years. Um, so it's not highlighting any pros or cons, it's just to, to highlight the different approaches. So it's important background information when comparing year-on-year -year performance, as the approaches to certification were very different in each of the years since 2020. Paragraphs 10 to 16 detail the, in, the, the use of Insight, a national benchmarking system, which provides schools and local authorities with attainment and achievement information. A number of members might recall att attending the training session, which was held in August 2022, where the use of insight was explained in detail. So paragraph 24 details the stage when young people left school. So that's whether they left at the end of S4, the end of S5 or the end of S6. And in session 2021-22, with the highest percentage of school leavers leaving at the end of S4, we are keen for young people to remain with us in school beyond S4 to maximise their opportunities to gain qualifications that are offered beyond levels typically offered in S4. However, I would like to highlight that 95% of those S4 school leavers progressed to a positive, school de a positive destination when leaving school. And that might indicate that it was a correct decision for those young people to, to leave as they progressed to employment, education or training. So whilst we would like them to stay with us, it might well have been the right decision for them to leave because, as we can see, 95% of those young people who left at the end of S4 progressed to a positive destination. Paragraphs 26 to 31 detail the initial destinations of school leavers in session 21-22. And I'd like to highlight the initial destinations figure of 96.85% in session 21-22, as shown in the table at paragraph 27. It's the highest initial destinations figure achieved in East Ayrshire, 
above the virtual comparator, the South West Collaborative and the National Performance, a significant achievement. I'd also like to highlight in paragraph 31 and the detail of how young people are tracked up to the age of 24. And it's important because if a young person progresses to a positive destination when they leave school, but they aren't able to sustain that destination, then they are offered appropriate support to ensure that they progress into another suitable positive destination. So they're not forgotten about when they leave school, they're tracked up to the age of 24. Paragraphs 32 and 33 detail the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, the SCQF, and it's a way of comparing Scottish qualifications in terms of how demanding how, or how difficult the learning is. And the graphic at paragraph 33 shows how current qualifications relate to previous qualifications. Paragraphs 34 to 37 detail attainment and literacy and numeracy at SCQF levels 4, 5 and 6. And at each of these SCQF levels, attainment in East Ayrshire compares, compares favourably to the virtual comparator, the South West Collaborative and the national figures. And the last section, paragraphs 38 to 40, detail attainment of school leavers based on national measures of the percentage of school leavers achieving one or more qualification at level four, five or six, and particular strengths coming through at levels four and six. So the head of education and chief education officer and myself are meeting with all secondary head teachers and the leadership teams to discuss individual school level attainment. And after this morning's cabinet meeting, a file will be added to the members portal with details in the measures included in this paper for each of the individual secondary schools. And finally, the achievements of this cohort of school leavers are significant, particularly when you consider the three different approaches to certification that S6 school leavers experienced. So I'd like to conclude by congratulating these young people on their achievements, whilst also recognising the support they receive from parents, carers, teachers and support staff. So happy to take any questions, members. Thanks very much, Graham. I, th I think we'd all like to, you know, thank uh, our young people for uh, some great, some great results there, and the people as you say to support them. Uh, members, any questions or comments, Elaine? Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Graham, for bringing the report to us this morning. I realise there's a lot of data, but I'm just going to um, uh, linger on your last point. There, it is significant when we think about the disruption these young people have had and their families. A lot of us perhaps have put. Um, the pandemic behind us now, thankfully, but but these children, young people and their families and all the support from the staff and the educational establishments, that was a real, real turmoil for them uh, across those those years and the different models. I can vaguely remember how stressful it was when I was at school taking the exams and that's when you knew what was happening, but they had all those unknowns. So we always like to see positive um, results and the fact that um, so many of the children are getting positive destinations and it has been tracked. So I'm um, really pleased with the information that's been shared this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Claire? I couldn't let this pass. I just had to say something because um, my two children went through fourth, fifth and sixth year using these various models and it was very tough. And I think um, what they and their friends have achieved it just shows that there's real people and these people now moving on and are into their adulthood now. But I remember not even 16 when lockdown went in and here they are moving on. So, yeah, real people, real children. And I know these children and their friends. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah, well, absolutely. Just hope that, you know, it's been unusual circumstances and that you know, don't suffer as a consequence and that, you know, that they've, they've really performed really well. And that's, that's encouraging. But we just need to keep looking at it. Uh, just how things progress. Uh, Maureen. Thank you very much. And yes, I think it would be important to to recognise the, the difficulties of the of the time and also for the staff across that period of time, which was not at all easy. Uh, and again, you know, what we have got here in the way of results is to be welcomed. Uh, could I just uh, also, in accepting that, you still there, Maureen? Oh, 
Maureen. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I've got a dodgy connection. I don't uh, know. Could... Why. It, it's on. It's only Fennec. Uh, <laughs> it's not a million miles away. Um, but uh, again, it, it is really just to ask the question. I see that we've conflated the lever destination, and again, that's very helpful with the results itself. But I think I'm right in saying this is the first time that the uh, results have actually come forward to cabinet. And I wonder if this is just in relation to the particular sets of circumstances that we're reflecting on, or if this is going to be a pattern that we are going to be expecting in future years. Thanks, Maureen. Linda? Yeah, through you, Chair, and thanks, Councillor Mackay. I think it's my understanding that we have had these results to, to Cabinet before. Um, they come after the publication of the Leavers data um, in the February after they go through the processes and they also make their way to governance and scrutiny. So I think they've been here before, um, Councillor Mackay. I would probably want to check that, but um, certainly it would be my understanding they've been here before in this format um, around about reporting on the, the Leavers data as it stands. Yeah, from memory, I think they have, but we'll, we'll double check that. I'm quite sure. Yeah. I, I think my question was not that we've had the data. I know that we've had the data in the past, which is helpful. It's about the timing of the presentation of the data. You know, we are actually at May. Yeah, so thanks through you, Chair. So again, timing wise, I would want to check on the specifics, but we received the report towards the end of February and that's then taken away and processed and worked through with the other schools uh, in case there's anything coming through. There's a bigger package comes with it, Councillor Mackay, called the analytical data set. So we've got to go through quite a bit of quality assurance there. But I think in terms of, of timing, it would be roughly the same. But I would again, I would just want to check on that, Councillor Mackay, but um, the actual data becomes available to us in, in late Feb. Um, and we've, we've tried to bring it to you um, as soon as we possibly can. But if we can do anything to expedite that in future years, that's something that we'll look at. Thanks, Linda. Maureen? Yes, thanks, Linda. That's all I can say at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Anyone else? OK, can we go to recommendations? And you know, once again, just thank the staff for all the hard work, Graham, and uh, your team. Uh, and uh, teachers and pupils, obviously, uh, are young people. And can we agree the recommendations in paragraph two? Okay. Item three, uh, sorry. Oh, right. That is the end of the items. Uh, it's, we'll just give the education people uh, time, to, time to leave and time to, uh, nice to see you. And, Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll now go to item four, which is a warm welcome spaces. Uh, I don't know if maybe warm, they're certainly welcome spaces. I think we maybe need to look at our names, but that's uh, what we've got just now. Uh, well, uh, Suzanne's going to take us through that report, Suzanne. Oh, sorry, I'm going to do that for you, Chair. Thank right. you. Thanks. Good morning, members. Um, this report is to feedback and to uh, or to report back to Cabinet after an updated detailed consideration by Governance and Scrutiny earlier in the year. Um, on the 23rd of March, we took a paper to Governance and Scrutiny just to look in detail at the cost of living, welcome, warm and welcoming spaces. Um, as you know, the campaign was launched in 2022 and an initial allocation of £270,000 was allocated to the welcoming spaces. Um, the the £122,000 was identified in the initial investment, so it was agreed that £100,000 would be reallocated and there'd be no further spend on welcome spaces going forward. So um, paragraph five details the recommendations that came from the Governance and Scrutiny meeting on the 23rd of March. I'll just uh, pull out a few of those for you. It was to note the progress of the network. 
to note the importance of the network as a signposting as well as providing a space that's welcoming to people it's also invaluable these spaces are also invaluable to signpost people to other um, resources that are available through the whole cost of living campaign um, it was also to note the numbers in the spaces, while at the time were small, the impact on the venues themselves was quite significant. I'm pleased to report now that in quarter four, our libraries have seen a 112% increase in attendances in libraries. This is fantastic for libraries who nationally are seeing a downward trend, so 112% from January to March in our libraries is very encouraging. Um, also, um, to note the reallocation of the budget and no more further spend on these areas. To note the continued role over the oversight group to make sure that the governance and arrangements are in place and they're being monitored. And to recommend to Cabinet that there's continued monitoring and review of these spaces. So the next steps for the welcoming spaces or the warm welcoming spaces is the continued review and monitoring and for us to respond to community needs as they arrive. Um, so these spaces are now set up, the initial investment has been put in place and we're now in a position across East Ayrshire Leisures and the community venues to respond um, to whatever the community need is. We are also about to start a customer exchange programme to look at opening hours, services and the what the provision is within all of our welcoming spaces and that's something that we can support and work with vibrant communities and doing for community spaces as well. And then the next step for vibrant communities is to continue that support for community-led venues. Very short and sweet paper, but I'm happy to take questions, Chair, if, if we're happy with that. Thanks, Annika. That's really encouraging news, uh, news in terms of library. Uh, that's uh, excellent. Uh, I mean, I think that the issue here is, you know, just in response to COVID uh, and as, you know, in the cost of living crisis as well, as not just, you know, we wanted to keep people warm, but uh, absolutely add to the social cohesion and get people, you know, one of the things that COVID taught us was people have been very much isolated and, you know, we very much wanted to, you know, get communities back out and people talking to one another and using, uh, using our facilities. So uh, there's been a great deal of success and that's, that's really welcome news. Um, anybody want to comment further? Oh, sorry, I hadn't got the microphone on. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I know the initial um, investment in this programme was on the back of the cost of living, but I have to say, um, in my own ward, the investment has been put into the Nucleus uh, Centre. One specific room, which was not getting used at all, just wasn't usable, is now fully functioning. Um, so there is a long a term benefit to this investment over and above the initial um, help with the cost of living crisis. Thank you, Chair. No, that's good. And and just as Annika said, you know, there's, there's long term benefits and we can also look at, a, you know, changing opening hours just to suit people's, you know, people's aspirations, you know, and, and uh, when people it's convenient for them. Uh, it's really important maybe bring in Lillian at this stage. Uh, Lillian's the Chair of Governance and Scrutiny and uh, Governance and Scrutiny have had a, a look at this as well. And it'd be good to hear from uh, the thoughts of uh, Lillian and, uh, and uh, the committee. Lillian, over to you. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, yeah, this um, paper was brought to government scrutiny. Um, we did have a good debate around um, the importance of our welcome spaces and how essential that they are in our communities um, uh, to help combat cost of living pressures for um, many families across our communities. Um, in saying that, it is also important that um, the investment is and the resource is targeted at, this, at the exact locations where it's needed most. And I'm um, pleased that in most cases it certainly was. Um, we also acknowledge that at the time of consideration of the paper, the warm welcome spaces were in their infancy. And, you know, and in some, some of the venues, um, the, the foot forward uptake was, was, was quite low. However, um, given the fact that we acknowledge that those warm spaces are in their infancy, we look forward to future reports and seeing those in, um, attendances Sorry, Lillian, you've frozen during the warm welcome spaces. Uh, we'll just give you a second to see if the connection comes back. 
Lily, you there? Uh, I'm back. It, can you hear me? I can hear you there. I'm just saying oh, you, you froze during the warm welcome. <laughs> Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, so basically, yeah, so as we're moving through the seasons, it's recognised that it's not warmth or heat that our families are going to be seeking. It's going to be mostly food, particularly when we enter into the stage of summer school holidays, um, where food provision um, will be really important for families who are under pressure financially. Um, and so to offer that um, as part of the, the offer within our welcome species um, would, would be... Um, most, you know, that, that's what's going to be most needed um, during these times. Um, I'd also just like to say that, you know, all of these warm welcome spaces, you know, the majority of them are volunteer run. And I think, you know, it's hats off to volunteers across our communities who are really stepping up to the mark and providing and ensuring that there's locations available for the community to come to and seek help, assistance, Get, you know, a wee bled every people just get out of the house um, and all of the other services, mental health, you know, financial inclusion. These are all really important services for all of our constituents. Um, so I think the, the, the recommendations from Governance and Scrutiny are in front of you um, um, within your papers. And, you know, as we, as we progress through the year, I look forward to seeing, you know, the progress that each of our warm welcome spaces, particularly East Asia Leisure Trust ones um, within our East Asia performance or whichever reporting format um, um, that they come through. So I think that's all I have to say, Chair. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thanks, Alan. I think you know you uh, make those points really well. I just uh, this is just about warm uh, spaces. It's about you know cohesion of the community and just those wee chats and. We're really indebted to uh, the you know the volunteers, the church groups, and the leisure trust, uh, and others that have really you know uh, stepped up to the, the plate here, and and it's really uh, it's encouraging to see uh, that go ahead. Just in terms of the, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Uh, Graham, then Elaine. Thanks, Dougie. It's just basically the the case study. Near third, it's pages four to six, four to seven. For me, the quotes for the local people that's been using that space, highlights we've done the right thing. It's the warm spaces have been a lifeline to me. I just don't know where I would be without this space. It's not just about the food or heat, but knowing I'm not the only one in this position. Um, and what a great space, amazing volunteers and so welcoming with no judgment. And I'm so grateful. I don't know how I could feed my kids without it being there. That for me sums it up and we've done the right thing. I welcome, thanks. I think, no, excellent example, Graham. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yep. Uh, Elaine? Thank you, Chair. It's just a minor point picking up on what both yourself and Councillor Jones mentioned there about uh, the purpose of uh, these spaces and uh, Councillor Joan mentioned open all seasons. So one of our colleagues, uh, Councillor Stephen Canning, had suggested perhaps the branding needs to change and, and it's actually about not being warm welcome spaces, but being welcome spaces. I know it's a minor, minor point, but I think that, that's it's a good one to raise at this moment in time. No, I, I, I think that's, I, I think everyone's just, uh, none of the in agreement there, just maybe welcome spaces. I think that, you know, it's some of the uh, authority and the leisure trust and everyone else is trying to encourage. Claire? I know we've been debating about this. I don't like the word spaces, they're places and they're destinations. So I would even call them welcoming places rather than spaces. Thanks. Just had to get an in. <laughs> Later, if it's okay, I maybe invite Katie to come in and just talk about how it fits with the whole cost of living work that's there because you can look at them on their own, but they're only one item of a wider package in terms of the cost of living. And I know it's the work Katie's been doing and she's going to pass on some of that to, to Joe as we go forward. So it might be good just tying some of that together. No, absolutely. I think really it's all been said. We've we've been more detailed in this than probably most things in my career. So I'm pretty confident that we're in the right track. And in terms of the campaign, I think you're absolutely right. It's about 
to me, what we call it, it's not about what sounds good, but it's about what attracts people and takes away stigma and makes people feel comfortable. And a wee bit like the quote we heard from the other third, if every citizen that we support feels like that, we've done a good job. So we, we're taking Lynn's good advice as part of the oversight group and the campaign is maturing and it is absolutely the time maybe to evolve what that network of spaces or places looks like. And we're absolutely open to that. And what we might ask, um, rather, you know, we've got some ideas in the chamber, but why don't we... Um, link back with our, the people who are running these on our behalf, our colleagues in East Asia Leisure, our community reps and our church community and ask them what they think would be the, the you know, and take some advice from them and then we'll fold that into the campaign. But as I say, it's been the heart of the campaign this because if that network's there in all seasons, it means it can morph into what people need from us at that time. And it doesn't matter whether you're affected with the cost of living or not. You want, We want people to connect and not be isolated. So I think it's been a great programme and I think it's had a lot of scrutiny and I think we'll only grow and, and develop. And there's an absolute commitment from all of the teams involved to make that happen. Hello. And just on that, Katie, for a localities in place perspective, we'll, we'll be dropping into all these places as we go forward and speaking to all these volunteers and bringing that back to Cabinet. Yeah. That's, that's, and that reflects some of the good work that uh, we're, we're doing there as well. No, that, that's good. I think just to reflect, you know, I, taking the board uh, comments from members, you take that back to the community uh, and just uh, reflect on that. And it could be a uh, welcome places, whatever, but, you know. Not even, an even better idea from the community, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll take that back and uh, look how that how we, how we how we label that. Okay, so uh, I think it's a good bit of work, and I just thank uh, Lillian and uh, the Gumson Security Committee and, uh, for participating in this. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a particularly good news story and a timely story that we, we must continue to just uh, you know improve and what we're, what we're doing, and uh, very encouraging for the future. Okay, uh, can we? Do I have to hear? Do I have to endorse the recommendations or from GNS as well? Or is there anything I have to do? Yeah, some of the per the recommendations per the report. Uh, Cabinet has been asked to 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 note uh, the various items, so that's that's the ask. The the recommendations as presented are fine. It's up to Cabinet if they wanted to use any other form of words, but uh, Cabinet's just been asked to note the outcome effectively and you've had the discussion about, you know, next steps anyway. So I don't think there's any need to go beyond the recommendations, Chair. No, that's fine. Just, uh, uh, okay, can we, with that, can we just agree the recommendations as laid down? Thanks. Okay, uh, I went to item five now, and that's the community asset transfer, and Craig, take us through that, Craig, please. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this report is to provide an update on community asset transfer activities and to make recommendations in relation to the extension of two management agreements. The recommendations are indicated in paragraph two, which we'll address in the body of the paper. Background is indicated in paragraphs three through five. The first consideration required is in terms of the former Onthank Community Centre. The building was initially agreed for transfer as a management agreement to Commandant Northwest Community Partnership in 2016. As part of the agreement, an element of staffing remained in place, which reduced over the course of the agreement. The partnership have grown into their role over the period and became an essential council partner during COVID, offering a food delivery service to some of our most vulnerable residents. The facility continues essential supports to their community with a larder, a welcome space and a community cafe. The partnership have also recently been successful with an application to the Nat National Lottery Communities Fund, which will equip the centre with a flexible IT space, increasing the use of the facility and also enabling digital services to restart within the centre. Increasing the capacity of the charity remains a priority eh, for vibrant communities. A focus on engaging with skilled trustees eh, to help develop the facility further is a priority for the next couple of years. The recommendation to Cabinet is to agree a five-year extension of the management agreement to retain the provision for East Ayrshire Leisure to reclaim 50% of late income and to agree the current level of staffing which the partnership receive. This will ensure the safe operation of the facility. The second facility for consideration is AM Brown Institute. Catherine Community Trust continue to grow and expand their offer within the AM Brown, including hosting a larder, a warm space and wellbeing interventions in the facility. 
The recent property management plan notes that the AM Brown Institute requires further investment to bring the building to an acceptable operating standard. And the, facility, uh, the services operated by Catherine Community Trust will help to be able to find the, fund, the significant external funding required to bring the building up to that standard. In order to assist with this, and a partnership approach has been implemented. Representation from East Desert Leisure, Vibrant Communities and Catherine Community Trust, as well as other local community stakeholders, and engaged with the shared aim of regenerating the building. It is recommended to approve an extension of the management arrangement to the 31st of March 2024. Again, the management arrangement will include provision for East Desert Leisure to reclaim 50% of let income over that period. The legal implications are indicated in Section 7. In terms of the finances, the management agreement with Commandlock North West Partnership for the former On Thank Community Centre will have a cost uh, implication of approximately £30,000 per year. This includes £20,000 in running costs and £10,000 for staffing costs. These costs will be met by existing facilities and property management budgets. With respect to the management arrangement with Catherine Community Trust for the AM Brown, this will have a cost of approximately £14,000 per year, which will be drawn down by East Desert Leisure through existing arrangements. The buildings covered by community asset transfer management arrangements continue to be maintained by the Council through the central repair account, as noted in the property management plan. The policy and planning implications are indicated in sections 11 and 12. There is no quality impact assessment implications um, or human resource implications. Risk implications are in section 15 and there is no net zero implications result from the paper. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Craig. Maybe take them one at a time, just as, as I laid down. Uh, uh, first of all, the on that Community Centre to the Come Up North West Community Partnership. Uh, I think that's, uh, that seems to be a good move. Uh, any comments on that? No? OK, uh, the AM Brown Institute to uh, Catholic Community Trust. Any Any comments? No? Okay. Uh, any comments in general? No. Well, we'll, we'll get, just get straight to the recommendations then. And uh, can we agree? Okay. And uh, annual corporate procurement strategy. And to take us through that, it's David. Thanks, Chairman, and again, members. Uh, as members are probably aware, uh, under the current procurement environment, uh, authorities required to have an annual procurement strategy, and our local arrangements are we tend to bring that to Cabinet normally in April, uh, but for reasons I'll explain, we're uh, a month behind, uh, but that was for positive reasons. Uh, we bring the strategy to Cabinet to make sure that Cabinet is happy that the strategy aligns uh, with Cabinet and Council's overall aims and ambitions uh, and policies and strategies. Uh, some subscribe to the view that procurement is no more than red tape and bureaucracy and rules and, and trips and falls for people, um, but others take the view that it is actually just another tool in the box. It's another way to uh, seek to deliver on those overarching aims and ambitions, and hopefully members will see that reflected in the strategy uh, as, as we go. Uh, in terms of background there, we are still currently working to, as per Para 3, the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014. So that still represents the current legal framework on which we need to undertake our procurement activities. Uh, but as we touch upon later in the paper, that should be replaced in the next few years. Uh, but it will be, I think, a matter of, of two or three years yet by uh, additional or alternative Scottish legislation. In the meantime, uh, the strategy requires, under the current arrangements, to set out in Para 4 how the authority intends to ensure that regulated procurements, which is those for 50,000 uh, or more on goods and services, or £2 million uh, or more on works, will, as you can see, contribute to carrying out procurement functions, deliver value for money, be carried out in compliance with our duties under the Act, uh, and, uh, and particularly at the end, we need to watch procurement and contracts don't become, I wouldn't say the dumping ground, but the, the panacea to all other issues in terms of the plethora of matters that are now 
been put into consideration for inclusion in contracts, some a lot more relevant to the activities being undertaken in the contracts perhaps than others, but you have a sweep of those at the bottom of page 55, so we now need to in, and do address uh, use of community benefits uh, and consult and engaging with those perfected by activity, payment and the living wage, promoting compliance with health and safety at work, promoting the use of fairly and ethically traded goods, uh, improving the health, well-being and education of communities and the promotion of animal welfare and how the authority will comply with the provision of prompt payments to suppliers, contractors and service providers. So that's just a, a smorgasbord, if you like, of some of those other requirements of the Council, other statutory duties of the Council, other concerns or objectives of the Council and how they are all, as I say, being uh, adjusted and adapted to fit in or with the procurement approach. Uh, paragraph 5 goes on to say uh, it's a bit like buses, there's not a lot happens, procurement came into governance it's actually, I was just reflecting 20 years ago it was 2003 uh, with three procurement officers and half an auditor, uh, we've come a long way since then, but even now, everything you see here is conducted by one excellent procurement manager and a staff of 10 that's 450 contracts and on the go at any one time on average, on a rolling basis. They're not all being retendered every year, but they are all in the WAVE programme over a five roughly year per period. So that's 450 contracts that need to be nurtured, managed, uh, prepared, spec'd, retendered, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, they do certainly punch above their weight for quite a small team in the support they give to delivering and, and helping other client services deliver on the Council's aims. Uh, what paragraph 5 tells you is <laughs> Scottish Government recently published, and I go back to the earlier comment, we thought it was worth waiting a month to see what the national strategy was so we can include reference to it here rather than come with our strategy in April and then come back and tell you if it was out a kin, uh, a kin, kinter, if that's a word, with uh, the, the public strategy. So section 5 of the report at page 56 sets out what the Scottish Government published as their uh, procurement strategy, their first public procurement strategy for Scotland at the end of April. And effectively there, and there's a lot more to it, but we've tried to summarise it as it says at 5.2, the main purpose is to use the collective spending power across the public sector to deliver sustainable inclusive economic growth. And then it tells us, I think, what we would all under know, and know and understand that inclusive economic growth is good for business and employees, good for society, good for places and communities, and uh, should be open and connected in terms of ensuring procurement in Scotland is open, transparent and connected at all levels. And Maybe look at the local impact further on in the in the paper. In terms of this as an annual strategy, in terms of this review, uh, we, we're going to say it has been a bit lighter touch because last year there was more of a deep dive because we had the revised national performance framework for procurement, which is touched on at six, uh, para 6.3. Uh, so we did a deep dive to make sure we were aligned with that last year. This year's lighter touch because of what is coming and the rest of section 6 goes on to outline in a bit of detail what is coming, which is effectively next will be the UK and that's the UK response to Brexit in the sense of, OK, uh, the current legislation is the legislation that was there to incorporate the EU procurement requirements uh, in the domestic legislation. They're now going to take the opportunity to review uh, the domestic legislation. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to change it, I think, for the sake of changing it, but what they will do is strip it back and we go on to comment on that, that if in Paris 6 onwards that the forms proposed when the bill are important because they'll shake up outdated procurement systems, every pound going further to communities and public services, the reforms will place value uh, for money, public benefit, transparency and integrity at the heart of the system, they'll modernise and unify systems and processes and they will get tough on the poor performers and those who try to defraud the sector. So that's the ambition in terms of the, 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 the public procurement reform bill to make it quicker, simpler, more transparent and better able to meet uh, the UK's needs while remaining compliant with international uh, rather than just European obligations, uh, a new regime based on value for money, uh, simpler, more flexible commercial system, etc, etc. So that's all to come. That's the promise. And obviously, we will need to, to, to compare that uh, once the bill's through and out the other side. But of course, that's the UK position. So that's not the end of it. The Scottish Government will then and have indicated their intention that once we have sight of the final form of the UK Act and it's been passed in that form, then we would expect to have further uh, Scottish regulations that will simply tie in both the current 
recently announced Scottish Government procurement strategy with the UK legislation and I don't think they'll be radically different. What you will have will be a Scottish version uh, that meets the Scottish public sector context, uh, but it will largely align, I think, with the final outcome from the UK bill. So against that background, we have only, in terms of the review, uh, tinkered with or amended or updated that which needs to be based on that operational need, recognising that this is a moving feast and there's a lot more to come in the next two or three years. And I won't go into the detail, members can see there, we highlight in each section thereafter from 6 8 onwards, uh, we summarise what changes have been made, which you can then see reflected in the detail of the strategy. Uh, I would highlight though at section 4, as you would expect, that in terms of the strategy rationale and context for this Council's procurement strategy, it is very, very heavily uh, being adapted to be built around rather than just including a passing reference to things like climate change and community wealth building. It has very much been modified and adapted to put that policy and strategic objective, etc., firmly in the middle of what we're trying to do as a Council through the procurement function to deliver on the community wealth building so it's uh, a, a good fit and hopefully it's found you know a good a good landing spot uh, rather than, than just a shot in the window in, in the window in terms of section six and i'll highlight a wee bit in the strategy where we're at in the spend uh, i think it's a fairly good news story but what's important is what members make of it uh, and, and in fact, I'll just touch now in, in terms of page 74, if you turn to the strategy. Uh, and don't do what I did. The first time I read this, I thought it was the fee council spend and I thought we were doing an awful lot better than we're, we're two near neighbours. But what we set out in, in under section six, spending finance, the, the figures to note there are that of £152,000 of spend from the council recorded through PCOS and picked up through the Spikes Cavell Data Hub. Uh, that's £152,000, million, pounds, sorry, it would be nice, it was just 152000 pounds million pound of spend in that 21-22 financial year. Then in total, East Ayrshire Council spent just under 55 or a third of that on local suppliers, by which I mean 350 suppliers in an Ayrshire context. But the Spikes Cavell only breaks it down to businesses registered in Ayrshire, but uh, colleagues have done that further work. And the bottom line is that you have a further breakdown of this council spend on suppliers across the three Ayrshire areas, all our spend. And you can see that 36 million of the 55 has been spent on lo 218 local suppliers delivering our works and services and supplies. Uh, just over 4 million on 55 suppliers in the North Ayrshire area and just over or 14, just under 14.3 million through 84 suppliers uh, in South Ayrshire. So that's a total of 357 local suppliers benefiting from 55 million of spend within the context of uh, this and previous year's procurement strategies. So you can still do it right and you can still direct the spend locally, but it is important it's always compliant as well. Uh, in terms then, back to the report, uh, nearly done now, but we highlight some of the other changes as well that have been made uh, in terms of uh, policies and tools. So it's all been updated there. There's reference to the Community Wealth Bill and Anchor Charter now and links to it, the climate change strategy and the digital strategy. So we keep this under review to reflect, as I say, changes and developments elsewhere in the Council. So it is uh, one working document on the basis, as always, with any strategy and action plan. You should have the comfort once it's in place that if you've approved it and it's up and running, if we deliver on the strategy and the plan, then we should del deliver on the underlying or support the Council in delivering on those underlying wider aims and objectives. So I'll stop there because I appreciate there is a lot to it, Chair and Members. Happy to take any other questions or queries. As I say, this is a working document and this is effectively what the Procurement Service will deliver on behalf of the Council over the next 12 months. Thanks very much. Thanks very, uh, thanks very much, David. Uh, an excellent report. I think the bottom line, you know, some of the uh, work you know, we've been doing with community wealth building uh, to you know to help suppliers right across Ayrshire and working between the three authorities uh, is really you know providing great dividends to uh, local suppliers and local businesses, and that's what we're really seeking to do. So, and that figure on page seventy four is quite incredible, one hundred and fifty two million pounds, uh, and and we're looking to strengthen that as as we continue to work. 
uh, with suppliers to 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 enable them to uh, to tender for contracts and and uh, etc. So that's really really uh, well done there, and uh, thanks to the procurement team. Uh, colleagues, any other comments? Elaine. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I find it very reassuring that the procurement um, team have their finger on the pulse here. Um, myself and uh, Councillor Barton and Councillor Maitland recently attended a community wealth building conference at Ayrshire College. Um, and, and during the presentations, we were given a, a, a small, quick demonstration of the, the Spikes Data Hub. Um, and, and that was really was quite enlightening and I understand um, because we had another follow up last week, I believe it was last Friday, um, with colleagues from procurement and economic development who gave us some uh, further insight into that uh, database and the way the data can be mapped and tracked uh, was very enlightening and very powerful if we get this stuff right, you know, on that whole well-being for people, places and the planet. Uh, obviously, it was a labour intensive task every year, I believe, to update the data. But the fact that, that we're using that to uh, support the communities and bring that community wealth agenda further uh, up the priority list, again, I find really, really reassuring. So uh, thanks for all the work there. I mean, I think that's something I think most of us would like to see. You know, it seems uh, quite interesting. And some, you know, maybe could use, you know, most contacts with local business groups uh, to let them see that as well, just to see just, uh, you know, the, the 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 success of working through uh, community wealth building and uh, being able to, to, to tender with, with the three local authorities and hopefully develop that with our public sector uh, partners. Uh, there's some there's some great things going on there. So, David, I don't know if that can be something that can be a part of a future, you know, a future presentation or some some get some of that information to members. That, is there anything we can do there? Or? We're always happy to look at it and assist. I mean, if there's value in, in producing information, then uh, we're always happy to do so. Le the, Leslie would have been here today, unfortunately, she had a hospital appoint, nothing serious, but she, she just, for personal reasons, couldn't be here. But uh, I can pick that up with her and we can, we can have that conversation if, if there's an appetite for that, Chair. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, OK, anybody else? Jim? Yeah, Ian? <laughs> Thanks, Dougie, and can I apologise for my, my way joining the meeting. I had a wee bit of technical difficulties this morning. David, eh, obviously, as we, we move away from the standard European legislation covering this field, I mean, I took great comfort in the, the how the European legislation was well-intentioned and, and transparent. I'm a wee bit concerned, obviously, about the, the use of the VIP lane for the UK government during COVID. Do you think this legislation makes examples like that more or less likely in the future? Sorry, Councillor Linton, that's not something I've got a view on. Uh, I'd need to look at the detail of that. I don't think it was necessarily about uh, either EU or British legislation. I think it's a question of actions that were taken in the context of an emergency and a pandemic. And I think it would very much be for others, I think, to account for those actions. Uh, I'm not sure it was a default in the procurement rules that allowed uh, any such things like that to happen. I think the issue lies in the decision making rather than the, the procurement legislation at that time. So with the greatest respect to you and other members, uh, I think I would leave others to express their own view on the merits of that one, if that's OK. Um, I can happily look at the detail, but as I've said, uh, you've got to remember that a lot of what was done was done in the context of emergency powers and a pandemic, etc. Uh, so, as I said, I think the issue lies more in the decision making than the content of either European or UK uh, procurement legislation at that time. Okay. Um, Neil. Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, uh, um, obviously, just reflecting on that figure of how much money we've been able to put back into community wealth building. Uh, and reflecting on how it's so important, especially at this time. Um, I'm really keen to see what comes to the review, uh, what the uh, recommendations it uh, gives in regard to procurement policy. I just wanted to um, just touch on the the way that we've used our community benefits. Uh, certainly, 
we've made excellent use supporting the, the defibrillator initiative uh, and the good work of the uh, health and safety and, and wellbeing team. And just give thanks to, to David Dorn and uh, Jane McKee for that. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll note that and pass that on to the team there. OK, can we agree the recommendations then if there's no other comment in uh, paragraph two? OK, thanks for that. And the final item is, as I'm noting mainly, is the minutes of the central JCC. Can we agree to note? OK, can I thank you all for your attendance? Uh, and see you soon. <laughs>